John Parshall's talk today will illuminate for you the role that subordinate commanders played at Midway and the contribution that their leadership made to resilience in 1942. Among those subordinate officers was the man after whom this auditorium is named. So please join in uh, welcoming John Parshall back to the stage of Spruance Auditorium. Thank you. Well, as Brad has alluded to, um, this is the second time that I've stood on this stage. I was here in 2007 uh, giving the keynote lecture to this same assembly, and I have to say that that was pretty much the, the highest stress speaking engagement I've ever had to do because, you know, to be a naval historian, to be standing on the stage of the Spruance Auditorium in front of all of you, in front of Midway Vets, a lot of brass, um, a fairly scary provost in, in the person of Jim Giblin. Um, that, was, that was relatively hard to get, get past. And, but it all came off very, very well. And everyone went home happy. I got my little plaque from uh, the president of the War College and went home, put it up on the wall. Keynote speaker, U.S. Naval War College, boxes checked, you know, next. And then about six months ago, the phone rings, and it's my friend, Professor Doug Smith. And he says, John, you did such a great job last time. Could you just come back out to the War College again, and could you do it all over? But this time, we'd like something brand new, please. And I get this sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, because what possible pearls of wisdom did I fail to dispense last time that I'm going to somehow magically conjure up for all of you today that are going to be better? And so there followed a dark time when I was trying, you know, desperately, <laughs> what's the angle going to be, you know? And I, I went through a couple of, of real clunkers, um, you know, the battle of, <laughs> right? It's got to be there somewhere, right? So there's that, or maybe decisive pinups of the Battle of Midway, you know, superficially appealing but really not germane to the mission of the War College. And then suddenly it occurred to me that I've got to be me. And so what we're going to, you know, I should draw on my real world experiences and that should be the subject of my talk. And so that is why we are going to spend the rest of uh, this time talking about minions, because that is what I am. Uh, here is, <laughs> this is my day job, people. I am the COO of a software company called Code Weavers. Here is the executive suite at uh, Code Weavers World Headquarters. And for the last eight years, my official job description has been that I do all the crap that the CEO doesn't want to do, except the pieces that look like they might be fun. And I'm sure that some of you can relate to that same sort of general job description, but that's what I do. As it turns out, there are a number of pretty interesting examples uh, during the Battle of Midway where subordinates, minions, affected the course of this battle in very crucial ways. And that's what I want to spend uh, the next little bit talking about. And you'll forgive me, I do not want to spend much time talking about the strategic context of the battle or the Japanese battle planning that led up to it. If you're interested in that stuff, I know a really good book that goes into excruciating detail on those things, and I'll be more than happy to, to get it into your hands. I want to talk specifically about the events of 4 June. And so to get us up to speed on how things went down, 4 June, 0430 in the morning, Kido Butai, the Japanese carrier striking force composed of four aircraft carriers, rolls into the neighborhood of, of Midway. The American carrier forces, as yet undiscovered, are lurking off to the northeast, and Kido Butai wastes no time in launching a very powerful strike against the island of Midway itself, which succeeds in destroying some of the refueling facilities, uh, and in the process also essentially eradicates uh, all of the uh, land-based fighter assets that are on that island. In retaliation, Midway sends out a number of its own squadrons to seek out Kido Butai, and uh, those squadrons are very roughly handled by uh, the Japanese Combat Air Patrol, starting at about 0700 in the morning. Uh, and the remaining aircraft that make it back to the Midway, uh, such as Bert Ernest and Harry Farrier's uh, Avenger that you see here, the sole survivor out of a squadron of six planes, are shot to pieces and uh, no results whatsoever are gained against the Japanese fleet. 
At the same time, the American carriers have now launched their aircraft against the Japanese, and the first uh, squadrons to come into contact with the Japanese carriers, of course, famously, are the torpedo aircraft uh, from first the Hornet, VT-8, uh, followed by the Enterprise, VT-6. And VT-8, of course, horrifically is uh, completely destroyed with only one man left alive in the water. VT-6, about 20 minutes later, at 0940, uh, loses two-thirds of its aircraft, and uh, you know the rest withdraw. Um, so it is not much of a stretch to say that at this point in the battle, things are going very, very badly for the home team. We have not managed to do a single bit of damage to the Japanese carriers, and we have lost a very great many uh, aircraft and brave airmen in the process. So that is where we pick up the thread, assuming this slide will advance. There we are. I want to talk about these two gentlemen. On the left, we have Wade McCluskey, who is the commander of the Enterprise Air Group. On the right, we have uh, Lieutenant Richard Best, who is the commander of Bombing Squadron 6. These two gentlemen have taken off at about 0715 with two squadrons of Dauntless dive bombers. And they have flown a generally uh, southern, uh, southwestern course. Uh, I don't have a pointer, that's fine. Um, the red line, roughly a course of 240. And they've been in the air now for about two hours. When they roll into where they suspect should be the location of the Japanese carrier force starting at about 0920, what they see is basically this, a whole lot of nothing. Got sea and sky and clouds and nothing else, not a ship in sight. This is a very bad thing because we've been in the air two hours at this point. The fuel gauges are starting to dip down relatively precipitously. And Doctrine at this point would call for us to implement some sort of an expanding box search, but McCluskey knows that he simply does not have the fuel to do that sort of thing. He's, he's going to have to make some guesses here, and he's only going to have a couple of them to make. So he brings his force around uh, to search a little further to uh, the southwest, thinking the Japanese may have broken uh, their course and, and gone more southerly. Nothing. And finally, in desperation, hauls back around to the northeast uh, to see what he can find up in, in that neck of the, neck of the woods. And at 0955, fortuitously, he sights a ship uh, ahead of him to the north, which turns out to be this gentleman. This is the destroyer Arashi at high speed, and she was at high speed on 4 June as well. And McCluskey very wisely reasons that that ship seems to be going someplace in a great big hurry. I think I will follow along behind her and see where she takes me. And lo and behold, in about five to seven more minutes, uh, he sees more wakes on the surface in front of him uh, to the north. And quickly, that formation uh, reveals itself to be the Japanese carrier fleet. So the sight that he sees across his windscreen as he's coming in from the southwest, he sees three aircraft carriers, two of which are relatively close to hand. One of them, a little further away and off to the right, is the carrier Akagi. And a little bit closer in and off to the left is the Kaga. Standard doctrine says if you've got two squadrons and two carriers, you should go after each of those with one full squadron. And we're going to use our leading squadron, which in this case is Scouting 6, to go after the further target, which is Akagi. And we're going to use our trailing squadron, Lieutenant Best's Bombing 6, to go after the nearer target, Kaga. Reason being that if we can do that, we will hopefully deliver our ordnance more nearly simultaneously and give our targets less opportunity to evade. Unfortunately, uh, McCluskey, having made a number of very good decisions up to this point, is not a dive bomber guy. He is a fighter guy. And he's just recently transferred into dive bombers when he took over the role as Enterprise's Air Group Commander. And through a series of communication snafus, what ends up happening is that both of his squadrons end up attacking the Kaga and Akagi is going to get off scot-free. This also is a very bad thing, and I am not uh, much of a counterfactual historian, but we're going to indulge in that for just a couple of minutes for the sake of argument here. What happens if Akagi gets away? Well, over on Akagi right now, we have this individual, uh, Murata, Murata Shigaharu, who is universally acknowledged as the leading torpedo plane expert in the entire Japanese Navy. Murata was the attack leader at Pearl Harbor, and his torpedo plane units were the ones that devastated Battleship Row and sank three of our battleships within about 10 minutes or so. His squadron is composed completely of Pearl Harbor veterans, and it is not much of a stretch to say that this is the finest torpedo plane squadron on the planet. 
heaven help the Yorktown if these guys get into the act and join with here use Counter-Strike that's going to start rolling in at about 11 o'clock this morning. Because if these gentlemen go out along with here use dive bombers and they catch the Yorktown, the odds are the Yorktown is going to be sunk right then and there. That's going to be it. At that point, we've got a crapshoot. We've got two American carriers, two Japanese carriers, and it's literally up in the air. I don't know how it comes down, but, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility to say that the Japanese might even go ahead and win this thing. They might sink all three of our carriers and lose only two of their own. If that happens, I can tell you with great certainty that the U.S. Naval War College analysis of this particular battle is going to be asking some very pointed questions. And one of the questions that they're going to be asking is, why is it that we had a guy like Wade McCluskey in charge of the Enterprise Air Group when this gentleman apparently did not know enough about the rudiments of dive bomber doctrine to put together a coordinated strike against two once-in-a-lifetime targets? And so people like me, 60 years on, would be writing books and we'd be saying, he's the goat. This is the guy that snatched defeat out of the jaws of victory. We could have, my God, what if we had actually hit Akagi then? We might have gone on to win this thing four carriers to one. So he would be the guy that would be getting you know, all of the, the finger pointing at him. But that is not what happened, and here's why. Dick Best very quickly assesses what's, what's going on with this attack. That, Kaga is getting a double helping of, of love here, and Akagi is receiving none whatsoever, and I need to take care of that. He's had his own attack run just foiled by McCluskey's uh, group going in front of him, and he pulls out of his attack run and very quickly gathers up the two remaining dive bombers that have not yet dived on this target, and he puts one of them on either wing, and he charges over, and he attacks Akagi. And again, Doctrine would say that we would like a complete squadron to go after the flagship of Kido Butai if we could possibly manage that, but I haven't got that. I got, I got three planes, and that's what I'm going to attack with. Fortunately for us, Dick Best not only is a very perceptive customer, he is also a heck of a good dive bomber pilot. And his rear seater said about him, well, nobody held their dives further or steeper than Dick Best. And so he was very well known for his accuracy, and sure enough, uh, there are three dropped bombs in this particular attack. Two of them are near misses, one of them a hit, and the one that hits, hits pretty much right where you see those zeros parked right there. And the forensic evidence that we have about this attack very strongly suggests that it was the center plane that dropped that bomb, and that would be Dick Best. <laughs> 